So good to be with you this morning. Um, I, I have a few things I want to share real quick, and then we're going to dive in. Um, I wanted to give you an announcement uh, about uh, some things that are happening here. Um, I wanted to give you the heads up that uh, Beginning Years Preschool, which is a preschool that meets uh, in Uniontown right now, um, they are changing locations, and they are going to start renting from us uh, in August 2018. They're going to be called Creative Beginnings Christian Preschool. And uh, you know, as a church, we care about investing in the next generation. We care about kids. And so for us, this is a no-brainer. It's a win um, to have them here at our church. They're going to be written space from us. We're going to be able to use those finances to further our debt payments, and we're going to have a ton of kids in this building uh, during the day uh, when nobody's here. Um, so uh, we are excited about that. So if you are looking for a place to enroll your kids for a preschool, uh, they are going to start taking enrollments, I believe, tomorrow, and they're going to be sharing with their folks as well that they're going to be here. So uh, if you have any questions about that, feel free to come talk to me after service. Just wanted to share that with you because I didn't want you to find that out through a grapevine either. Um, if you've got a Bible, open it up to Luke chapter 15. Luke 15, uh, we're going to dive right in this morning because we've got a lot of ground to cover. Um, and so really what we're doing today is um, how many of you uh, have to set reminders for things? Go ahead and raise your hand. Maybe some of you like for your anniversary, right? Let's be honest. Anniversary, birthdays, you have to set reminders. Um, I, I, the, I'm thankful that uh, my daughter and my wife were born in a week span of each other, so it's easier for me. Um, I set something in October, and I go, I'm good. But every once in a while, we have to set a reminder as a church to remind ourselves of what we care about because it's easy, almost like a boat, for you to get off one degree, and before you know it, you're in a place that's completely different than where you want to be where you felt God called you to. A life can end up like that too. You, you kind of hear God's call, but you're off a degree or two, and you never have time to actually pause and reassess where you're at and remind yourself what God's called you to. And before you know it, you're in a place you never thought you'd be before because you go, I just I feel distant from what God's called me to. And so here's what we're doing this morning. What we're doing this morning is we're reminding ourselves of what kind of church God's called us to be. And here, here's why that's important. Maybe you are newer here. Maybe you've been here, you know, three or four weeks, and you're trying to settle in. You go, I like this church, but I'm trying to figure out more what they care about, what's in their DNA. And, and so it's important for you to be able to hear that. Maybe you go, you know, I, I've been here for a long time, but it's so good to, to be rejuvenated and, and reminding ourselves what we care about, the, the, the reason that we exist here. Because, friends, if we're just doing church to do church, shame on us. Amen? if we're just going through religious behavior just for the sake of it, if there isn't God's heart inside of our chest, but we're just going through and just doing church because it's the thing to do in our township, shame on us because we've missed the heart of God. We've missed the heart of God. And friends, I don't want to miss the heart of God. I don't know if you do. I, I don't. I want to ensure that as a church, we have God's heart inside of our chest that every single day we wake up, we're going, what is God calling me to do and what am I going to do about it? And so what we're doing today is we're just reminding ourselves, what kind of church are we? What do we care about? There's plenty of churches. There's a billion churches. The question is, what kind of church is God calling us to become? And so that's what we're going to look at this morning. Go ahead and open up to Luke 15, verse 1. I'm just going to hop right in. Um, the scripture tells us, it says, tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus' teaching. This made the Pharisees and teachers of the religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. See, Jesus was creating this reputation as he was going through his ministry that people who were notorious sinners and, and tax collectors, people who were despised at that age, were starting to come around and hang around and listen to him teach. And the, the religious establishment, the, the people like me, the preachers, the, all those people were sitting there going, why is Jesus hanging out with those kinds of people? What's he doing with those kinds of people? It's crazy that Jesus would surround himself with people that you look on the outside of society, you go, those are, those are people on the margins. Why would you want to spend time talking with them? Joel Green is a New Testament scholar. He puts it this way. He says, the importance of the table as an instrument for drawing and maintaining socio-religious boundaries from the perspective of Jesus as adversaries has been repeatedly ignored by Jesus. Indeed, in the present instance, not only is he blamed for eating with sinners, that is, at their invitation, so they would invite him to the table and he would come, but apparently he was one who extended hospitality to them as well. 
So Jesus thus behaves towards these outsiders, these unclean, contemptible persons, as though they were acceptable, as though they were his own kin. See, Jesus, as he's going through his ministry, he starts to attract certain kinds of people who are on the outskirts of society, and he's somebody who goes to them and doesn't expect them to come to him, and and he's looking at these pastors and these people that are part of this religious establishment. He goes, you don't get it. You don't get it. You expect people to make their lives nice and tidy and then come to you? You expect them to live these perfect lives and and everything is nice with a bow on top of it? You, You expect them to just come with no baggage or mess? And so you're not gonna associate with anybody who's an outsider. You're not gonna associate. Do you understand? Do you understand what you're implying through your actions? Do you understand what you're portraying about God through the way you live your life? See, what Jesus does is he says, I don't wait for people to get their lives together and for them to be sinless before I associated with them. No, I sat at their table, amen? I I joined you in the mess. I, I came down to be with you. You didn't find me, I found you. I came to be with you. He didn't throw a Jesus conference and say, hey, come on over to this Jesus conference, let me teach at you. No. He left the heights of heaven to come and be with us. He left the comfort of a throne to meet us where we were at. And friends, if we ever forget that, if we're never reminded of the humble position where we were when Christ came down to be with us, if that's not on the forefront of your mind, we've got to remember that Jesus was the one who gave us the time of day. He's the one who talked to us, listened to us, ate with us. He left everything that was safe and familiar to to come to the earth, uncharted territory, because the, the risk, the risk was worth it, because the reward was so great. He wanted his people to come back to God, to know the heart of God. So he looked at these religious teachers and he said, you don't know the heart of God. You know religious behavior, but you don't know the heart of God. And so he tells them this story. He says this, if, if a man has a hundred sheep, and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go search for the one that is lost until he finds it? How many of you have lost something valuable? Like five people? Wow. Maybe I'm an outlier. Um, You ever lost something and it's maddening to you? So you search all over the house to find it. You lost your wallet, your keys, you lost some heirlooms, you're searching through everything. You know, Monday night, I-, I was sitting here and I was reading this text and I was trying to kind of prepare for this week. I was reading some uh, commentaries and, and it was about 11 o'clock, so I decided to go to bed. And uh, so when I fell asleep, I had this dream that was surreal. Have you ever had those dreams where it feels like you're really there? So that was where I was at. And this is what happened, right? And this tells you how negligible I am as a parent, I guess. Um, but... I, in this dream, not in real life, in the dream, I had alone, by myself, taken Elsie, our 14-month-old daughter, to a carnival to play. Um, Bad parenting, to say the least. So, um, because I am ill-equipped for that. So, um, this picture doesn't do the dream justice, but this carnival was filled with rides and colors and all kinds of things. And so, I remember being in this dream, and I'm mesmerized by all of the lights and the sounds and everything. I'm just looking around, and I've got Elsie down here. She's at the age where she can walk, and she's got a, you know, she's just a little misindependent. So, she's kind of right there, and I'm looking, I'm amazed, and then I look down, and she's gone. Has this ever happened? You don't have to raise your hand for this. <laughs> So I know you wouldn't, but it's happened to you as a parent. Maybe you're in a Kmart or something. You're shopping around. You go, oh, my gosh. I'm going to be on the news. Where is my child at? So I'm sitting there, and I'm like, oh, my. I'm, like, amazed by all these things. And I look down, and she's gone. And then I have this maddening sense where I'm like, I just have to keep searching. I'm like, first thing, I'm like, Becky's going to kill me. Um, second thing was, i got to keep searching. So I'm sitting there, and I'm searching over every ride, every food truck, every single square inch of this car. I can't find her. 
I look everywhere. I can't find her. I, I, every single fortune telling booth, every single ride, I'm sitting there. I feel my blood pressure start to rise. I start to sweat. My anxiety grows as time goes on because I'm searching. I'm searching. I'm searching. I couldn't find her and I couldn't rest, right? I don't know if you've been there before, but you're searching for something. You can't rest. You can't pause because you just keep going and going and going. In fact, I was so hysterical in the dream, I was bumping into people that probably thought I was crazy. Because I'm just hysterically running through this carnival to find my daughter. And eventually, I woke up. But it was one of those where you wake up and you feel like you didn't leave the dream. And so I ran downstairs and praised the Lord. Elsie was down there watching Moana, right? And I was like, whew. But you know what I felt like God was telling me in that moment and why he gave me that dream was because he wanted me to get a glimpse of how passionately, relentlessly, recklessly he chases after us. Amen. I thought it was a picture. And so Jesus tells the religious leaders, imagine you're a shepherd and you're responsible for a hundred sheep. That, that, you're, supposed to, you're supposed to care for those. You're watching over these, right? It's your job to protect them, to care for them. Now, now imagine one of those sheep goes and gets lost as you're going from place to place. He goes, wouldn't you leave the 99 and go after the one? Now, economically, we'd go, no, right? Why would I risk 99 to go after the one? It was probably one dumb sheep. See ya. That's what we think, right? We go, well, I'm just sorry. It's, it's in the margin of error, Right? Why would you leave the comfort of the flock? Why would you leave what was known to go after what was unknown? But Jesus says, here's the deal. The story I give you is the heart of God. And it's my prayer that the same heart of God rests within your chest, that you'll be that kind of a shepherd, that you'll be that kind of a church, that you'll live your life that way, no matter your vocation. So that's why he says this, he says, and when he has found it, when the shepherd's found the lost sheep, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. When he's arrived, he'll, he'll call all of his friends and neighbors together saying, rejoice with me for I've found my lost sheep. In the same way, there's more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 persons who don't repent and have it straight away. See, Jesus is saying it's worth it to leave what's comfortable, what's known, and to go after the one it's worth it. It's worth it because of the moment of being able to throw the sheep over your shoulders and bring it home. And the whole village rejoices because what was lost is found. In fact, they throw a party, right? And Christians, we, we kind of have a bad rep when it comes to parties, right? We, we're like, oh, we're the Debbie Downers. No, but what Jesus says is the heavens rejoice when one person comes back. It says the shepherd took the initiative. He doesn't wait for the sheep to come back. He risks it all to go after the sheep. See, here's the reason I tell you that story. What would happen if God's church lived like this? Not like a consumer church where we're going to put on a good show and you guys come and we charge admission and then we're done and we'll see you next week. What would happen if the church lived like this? They said, you know, we're going to leave Sunday. And we believe God's on mission outside these walls. And so whatever my vocation, whatever season of life I'm in, I'm going to join God on his mission because there's people who are far from God. And so I want to bring them back to the Father's embrace because God says that over one person who comes back, the heavens throw a party. What would happen if a church cared so passionately about this that they risked financially to do it? They didn't just talk, because talk is cheap. But they financially put their resources to, to work because they cared for reaching people who were far from Christ. What would happen if every single person who came back to Christ, we celebrated them? Not because we boast attendance numbers or because it's good to say we had this many baptisms, but because God's at work and bringing what's lost back to his arms. The reason I tell you that is because that's the kind of church we want to be. Amen? Amen. There's plenty of churches. 
But what God's called us to do is to be a disciple-making church. A church that doesn't expect people to come to us, but instead will be a church that takes the initiative to go after the one. That's why our whole vision statement has been from the beginning, right? Make disciples of, of Jesus, one person, one family, one neighborhood at a time. We care about reaching the one. We care about leaving comfort and going into this risky environment because it's worth it. I mean, what would happen if the 500 people who call this place home said, I'm not going to settle for a church as showing up to a building and hearing a lesson for 30 minutes and then leaving? But instead, they say, I'm going to risk what's comfortable and normal to take initiative to go after the one. See, here's the beauty of this. Uh, you don't have to be a pastor to do this. You don't have to go to seminary to do this or rack up all the student loans that come with that. You can do this. Right now, whatever vocation, whatever season of life, however new a Christian you are, you can do this. You could be a stay-at-home mom or an accountant, an electrician, an engineer, a teacher, a dentist, a small business owner, and you could do this. All it takes is courage and a willingness to risk comfort because you know that the reward outweighs the risk. Amen? And so as a church, it's our job to equip each person that calls this place home to join God on his mission, to not expect people to come to us, and that's the pastor's job, that's what we pay him to do, but to recognize that every single one of us can be sent as a missionary. Every single one of us can be used by God to bring the one sheep back to the fold. So what's it look like to join us in this mission? Uh, what's it look like to link arms with us? Uh, you should have, when you uh, came in here, you sat on a card, probably. Uh, go ahead and pull that out. I want you to hold your car up real. Go ahead and hold it up as high as you can. Thank you, Justin. You can put it down. But I want you to look at it. There are individual steps that you can take to join us, and there are corporate steps that we do to help you join us. So I want to go through a few of those. Individually for you, it, it might be, you know what, I've kind of settled for casual Christianity, and what I want to do is instead, I, I want God to bring one person to my mind that's in my life that's spiritually lost. And I'm going to make a decision today to pray for them every week and to actively seize moments where God opens up a doorway for me to share hospitality with them. Maybe you go, you know what, there's this family in my life and I know they're going through a rough patch, but I feel like God's called me to practically share God's love with them, to, to come alongside them as they grow in their relationship with God. Think about the place you live or the place you work. God's put you there for a reason. God can use that for a reason. And so maybe for you, it's what's it look like to bring good news to your workplace? What's it look like to use that as a platform for something bigger than just bringing in some money? There are also steps that we can take as a church. So look at that card, and I want to go over these steps briefly. Maybe your next step in reaching the one is coming back to God yourself. You've run for a long time for whatever reason. And maybe for you, the next step is simply saying, I need to accept the, the greatest gift that's been given. Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Be baptized into Christ. And if that's you, I encourage you to mark that on your card. Maybe your next step in reaching the one is to join a serve team here. We have hundreds and hundreds of people every single week who come here. Hundreds of kids. But the truth is, none of it would be possible if folks didn't step up and serve. None of it. So maybe for you, you go, you know what, I've attended this church for a while, but I haven't really used my gifts for anything. And so you could step up and use them for Treehouse Kids Ministry or Student Ministry, Worship, Tech, or Communications Ministry, Welcome and Facilities Ministry. Maybe you want to get on the, the things that we're doing on Saturday where we serve once a month on Saturdays. Everything in between, there's opportunities for you to be able to step up and serve. Maybe your next step is joining us or starting a One Community. I want you to take a look at this video of how One Community had an effect on Kurt's life.
When I first joined River Tree, we were meeting at the uh, Lake High School in the auditorium. And uh, basically, I would uh, show up on a Sunday, I'd shake a few hands, I'd sing a few songs, listen to a, uh, a teaching or, or a sermon, and uh, take communion and pray a little bit and then go home. And uh, basically, I would check out for the rest of the week until the next Sunday. For me, at the time, this has been nine years ago, I was going through a, a, a loss in my life, and, and uh, there was a, uh, a very caring group uh, that kept bugging me uh, to join uh, their group, which we then called them Thrive Groups. So uh, after a few lame excuses, uh, I finally gave in. I said, okay, I'll be there, and they happened to meet on Friday nights. And you know, I'll never forget pulling into the driveway of the home that we were meeting at, and uh, I was not too comfortable. Uh, I had all these notions going through my mind. Uh, you know, am I going to have to share all my uh, all of my brokenness with this group? Uh, you know, what if they ask me something about the Bible that I, I've never read or don't know anything about? Uh, what if they ask me to pray out loud? You know, oh my. Uh, well, of course, none of that happened. And so I went in, and then I went the next week, and the next and the next and pretty soon I really started to look forward to going and I found out that uh, uh, I was getting more out of the group they were helping me not only in my walk but also spiritually and then after a while uh, I seemed to be contributing myself and I truly felt blessed uh, when that happened now time has passed and uh, I've been involved in three one communities uh, all of which are a little bit different but uh, the bottom line is, is we always held each other up in prayer and in need. Uh, we tried to help each other become better disciples and make disciples of others. And so I, I really encourage you to pray about, think about, uh, check it out, uh, becoming involved in a one community. And uh, if you do, I truly believe that you'll not only uh, feel like I did and be glad you did, but also truly blessed. Now uh, we're going to transition into a time of offering. We've done this intentionally. If you're a guest with us, we don't want you to put under pressure or obligation to give. But the reason we've done this intentionally is because of what Paul says in Romans 12. He says this, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true Proper and see, what Paul hits on here is, is something important. In light of what God's done through Jesus Christ, we have the opportunity to worship. And so offering is not simply using financial resources for that. It's, it's giving your life. It's the entirety of your life joining God on His mission. Your finances, your marriage, your vocation. All for the sake of reaching the one. So when you give financially, you don't just give so you can keep lights on. You don't give so I can have a job. You give because we're trying to reach the one. Because we want to be a church that's here and has this footprint in Lake Township that is continually leaving what's comfortable and going after the one. And so the reason we had to hold all those cards is because we believe that your next step is an act of worship as well. And whatever step God has for you, it's a, it's a step forward, and it can be used by God for something good. So here's what we encourage you to do. If you call this place home, I um, encourage you to give, to give faithfully, because you've seen the results of what's happened when the church tries to reach the one. And whoever you are, you have a card in your hand, we encourage you to put that in the offering bag as it passes as your act of worship as well. What I'd like to do is I'd like to pray. And then we'll have our service come forward for an offering. We'll encourage you to put those cards in there. And if you decide to take a step, one of our staff members will be calling you this week to help you take that step. And let's pray for this offering and these next steps of obedience to God. Let's pray together. God, we give you thanks for this morning. We give you thanks that, that you have provided in so many ways. We just pray over this offering. We pray for the resources that are given, God, that they would be used to see this, this vision come to fruition. And we pray for every single next step. 
that is represented in this room. We pray that you would use the resources and the steps of obedience to lead the 990 walk to the water. We pray this in Jesus' name.